with us, um, as I mentioned, are um, Andrea Myers and Jeffrey Hayes. Uh, Andrea, many of you may remember from uh, two years ago when we did our inaugural exhibition in the space when we first moved here from Bexley. Uh, she was one of our featured artists, and both she and Jeffrey um, collaborated then as well. Um, they did another installation in the back part of the gallery that also took up all the space and used natural light. So we're kind of revisiting that here again. Um, since then, um, Andrea has been um, very busy as an artist. Um, she has had, among other things, um, participated in a textile symposium in Latvia. Um, she had a residency at um, Textile Arts Center in New York City. Um, she also had work on exhibit at the University of Akron and at the Elmhurst Art Museum in Elmhurst, Illinois. Uh, most recently, she received a residency from um, the GC Greater Columbus Arts Council. So she will be going to uh, Dresden, Germany this summer as part of GCAC's International Artist Exchange Program. Um, she received her MFA in uh, materials in fiber and material studies um, from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, and currently she is um, professor of um, sculpture at uh, Kent State University. On the right is uh, Jeffrey Hayes. Um, he is associate professor and coordinator for the interior design undergraduate program in the Department of Design at OSU. And according to the uh, website at OSU for the Department of Design, um, he is specifically exploring alternative ways of representing spatial ideas to better understand issues of scale, spatial perception, location mapping, and emotional contents within interior environments. Uh, so, um, thank you for everyone for being here. Uh, my first question goes to Andrea. Uh, as I said, she curated this exhibition. It is a group show. Uh, there are seven artists total working in all different mediums. Um, we have fabric, uh, we have porcelain, um, we have painting, both abstract and representational. Um, we have shaped fabric, and we have this installation behind us, which is kind of like multimedia. Uh, so can you please explain to everyone, and they're, they're, it's all kind of connected by the idea of the soft grid. Um, could you please explain the theme of the show to everyone and how that came about? Sure. Um, so I guess it was a year and a half ago maybe that the gallery asked me to come up with a curatorial idea um, around the 20th anniversary, but also have a show of my work. So. Um, I kind of, it was nice to have such a long lead time to think about and kind of reflect on maybe a, a curatorial theme for the show. Um, so really, you know, it's interesting when artists work as curator as well because I think we're just kind of going with the, the gut and the love that we see for other artists' work. So I was just kind of starting to pay attention. Some of the people in the show, like Jason Kerouac, um, who has the, the black and colorful paintings over there, and then Jean Freider, who has kind of the, the textural, crumpled grid and, and folded fabric um, forms on the other wall. I had gone to graduate school with them, so I was familiar with their work, and then other people kind of um, coming to um, my attention through my job or the arts community in Columbus. So I kind of starting the curatorial process from my own work and then kind of paying attention to the other kindred spirits um, that I saw in the art world. Um, and just noticing and thinking about, uh, there was a reading I had done and I give to students uh, from Art and Fear that talks about how there's, that humans cannot make anything perfect because we aren't perfect. So um, don't try to make anything perfect. And just thinking about the, the allowing the imperfection and kind of being proud of the human hand in my own work and others' works was kind of that, that beginning of thinking about this soft grid or soft geometry and how we desperately try to make things that are perfect or perfectly symmetrical or perfectly, you know, this perfect triangle, whatever perfection is, and that it's, we're going to disappoint ourselves if we hold on to that too hard. So working in abstraction, I tend to just try to allow a, a gesture and, and myself to filter through into, into my work. So. I guess that's kind of the starting point for the, the soft geometries idea is um, just the, the playfulness and the gesture in, in the human hand and that how artists embrace that and um, kind of showing that in the group show. So. Okay, and um, you and Jeff, as I mentioned, um, had worked together before. Um, actually, this is what maybe the third or fourth time. Um, you did an installation here, as I said, two years ago, and then prior to that you had collaborated with one another at Art Prize. Um, 
and then also at the Urban Art Space um, and at the Cultural Arts Center. Uh, and for some reason, you know, you don't see too many collaborations. Uh, could you please tell everyone like how this first came about, the two of you working together? Uh, maybe I'll talk about it, and then if Jeff has anything to add. But um, we were invited by CCAD in Ohio State at the time. We were, I was teaching at CCAD, and so they they basically blindly paired us to do a collaborative piece. It was a show at Urban Art Space called In League, um, and they were choosing one faculty member from each, each school to collaborate. I think a lot of the other people knew, had already known each other, but Jeff and I didn't know each other. And someone said, hey, you know, it was Scott and Michael Goodson thought our, how we were working could combine to be pretty interesting. So um, we met, initial meeting with Scott, the curator, and had coffee and kind of started just talking about some of the things, parallels in our work or similarities and differences. And, and I think our, our project was one of the truly most collaborative ones in that show where it wasn't just like, oh, hey, here's my work and here's Jeff's work. It was this melding and, and hybridization of, of our works. So um, that's kind of how it began and then just has kind of carried on in different iterations. So I don't know if there's anything you would add to that. But <laughs> I, I think that, that what's been really rewarding about that first kind of collision of us is that we work really symbiotically. We, we push and pull each other and sometimes I'm pulling uh, Andrea into sort of more of an architectural world, um, but other times she's pulling me into an architectural world and sort of the same thing uh, sort of respectively with art as well. Um, and, and it's really nice because the two of us, um, when we work together, have both uh, a strength and a knowledge of our own disciplines um, and way of working, but it, it, we're, we've worked enough together that we also are, are pushing each other in our, in our own separate ways, and, and, and our work often does that. And it starts as one thing, and it's always amazing how different it ends. Uh, it's a really fun and enjoyable journey of exploration, usually. Yeah, then we're, we've become pretty com comfortable with the fact that as we're talking and meeting or just texting each other images or drawings or things, we're, the whole time we're saying, well, this is going to change. Yeah. <laughs> this, isn't, this isn't what it's going to be. But it just is this, like, this process of kind of um, teasing it out of the drawings or the, the words we're coming up with or concepts. And, yeah, me kind of stepping into the design realm and Jeff stepping into the fine art realm, but we both have that. I mean, we're, we both see ourselves as makers and we don't really like to be kind of cornered or defined too, too much. So I think that we definitely have that in common and that brings a pretty interesting collaborative spirit between us. But, yeah. So as you describe it, it really was, you said, truly a collaboration. It wasn't just you doing your, your part and Jeff doing his, but there was this back and forth. You guys had your meetings, and you even text it back and forth. Uh, could I ask, what came first? Was it the material or the idea? So first of all, you know, as I said, their collaboration is behind us. Um, so we have that. Maybe we should yeah. explain what that is. Yeah, I, the, a year ago when we got together and this project or this space was sort of on the table, we'll say, um, it was very clear to us that um, it was going to be the inaugural sort of, or, or the, the kickoff of the 20 year anniversary. Um, at least that was sort of the way it was expressed. And so um, our initial discussions and conversations around that really had to deal with the issue of time reflection um, and, uh, and the number 20. Um, and we did a lot of bad math, as we often call it, um, because that's not our specialty, um, uh, around what all those things are and how one reflects. And, and despite the really interesting process of exploring, finding a material and controlling something this large, this 20 by 20 grid um, really represents that exploration, um, I, I think, and, and the idea that uh, though it's just 20 years, and I say that facetiously, um, it's, it's 400 panels, right, 20 by 20. So, so it really uh, expands itself immediately as soon as you start to, to think this way, and we thought that this time 
was really important uh, to think about reflection and how we reflect over 20 years of what we've done and how we've, where our accomplishments were, um, and felt that this piece, at the end of it, though we didn't really have a, a visual sense of where it would end up, we, we wanted it to sort of be a, a lens to, um, to create that sort of reflection of 20 years or of time. Um, and so the space inside is actually the time. Um, and the light and the metronome, which is probably the most literal <laughs> uh, um, impersonation of time, and it impersonates time because it's not very accurate, because um, it swings one way faster than the other, uh, which you found out really quickly, um, is, is, was really about trying to, that surface to sort of be this lens in order to, re, in order to create that, that sort of ritual space or place of reflection. Um, and so the piece was wonderful because it seemed to have qualities of, of a journey across time um, with things that were whimsical at moments and very serious and very controlled at others. And, and I think that that was really, those are the kinds of conversations that we had. And this was all prior to getting a gigantic sheet of industrial strength shrink wrap and uh, and start heating it, sewing it, and messing with it, which I think is another conversation. Yeah. Yeah, so how, how did that come about, um, using the industrial shrink wrap? So the budget was a big part of every project. And Andrea, um, how much money do you have? And Andrea goes, I don't know, an Jeff, artist, how much so. money do you have? And I sort of said, all right, well, that limits things, because um, we still wanted it to be big, because um, that was always intentional to have this space back here and to really kind of uh, um, have it consume the back of this gallery. Since it was given to us, we didn't want to not take up that adva the advantage of that. Um, and so I had worked with this material once before with a group of students in a workshop in Wiesbaden, in Germany, um, and we experimented and built with this. Um, so I was familiar with it and had contacts at a place called drshrink.com. That's my, that's my plug for them. Um, and they sell this stuff internationally to wrap around boats and buildings and on things like that uh, for sh on ships to keep stuff um, stored. And they put flames on it and it shrinks right around. And you've probably all seen boats with the blue plastic strapped around it. That's this stuff right here. They just happen to sell it also in white. And, uh, and I talked to my friends up there and said, hey, I'm thinking about doing another project and we need a sheet about this big. How much do you think it would cost? And um, you know, lo and behold, he said, for you, Jeff, it will only cost uh, shipping and handling because we like um, the crazy stuff you do with our materials. <laughs> so we end up with a giant sheet of this stuff. And, and, uh, and at that point, the fun really began. Right? So yeah. tell us about you know, what you did when we <laughs> spread this gigantic sheet in a yeah. huge room that we had for the summer and how we yeah. dealt with it. Well, we, um, so we, we knew we wanted to take a large sheet and kind of render it down to that 20 by 20 foot to kind of have this um, indirect wink to the 20th anniversary. Um, so, and we wanted to embed a grid, which you can see is, is sewn. Um, so all the seams are sewn, and then they're, they're also heat set. So the, the heating process, the heat gun, makes the material kind of warp and pull. Um, so we also use the heat gun around where we were cutting holes out. But So the, the, the first thing we did was mapping out that grid and, and creating the folds and then sewing, sewing the seams with Jeff came up with, you know, he has these little MacGyver moments, so he, he made this uh, uh, sewing machine car, for lack of a better term, but basically like this little um, contraption to put my sewing machine on so we could move it down the, I don't know, I mean 20 foot length of the material versus usually when you're sewing you're pulling, you're letting the material go through versus like using the sewing machine and we walked it back and forth and it was you know, kind of this, um, I feel like with the projects we've done, there's this little battle between us and the materials, always, always yeah. you know, and, and kind of 
And I, will, I would also say that we're not precious with our materials either. There's a lot of kind of, you know, physicality and walking on things or pulling them or cutting them or tearing them and not being afraid of, of you know, just allowing that gesture to happen versus treating it too preciously. Um, so sewing all those seams. <clears throat> and so we had this really beautiful, I mean, quilted looking 20 by 20 sheet uh, with all this grid embedded. And, and as you look at it in here, it looks pretty regulated, right? It's, but up close, the measurements are a little skewed because you have that pull of the sewing machine and, and the manipulation, getting things off an inch here or there. And so, but trying to kind of fight back on it. Um, and then we, and then so it, you know, as an artist too, it's like, oh, you have, you, you've made this kind of beautiful ground, and now we're going to cut into it and burn it and remove from it, and kind of taking that first step of incision and, and removal of material to create this both closed and open composition, very much like other things I'm doing in my my own bodies of work too. So. And and as an as an architect, you know. One requirement is that there has to be an interior. You have to have a front and a back and an inside and an outside because the experience of moving through a surface uh, from outside to inside is always a component of time, right? And so, um, so it was always our desire to sort of have it create some sort of ritual space um, uh, in, inside. And, and the, as much as you could mess with it when it's laid across tables and tied up to columns inside of a, a classroom that we had on campus that still wasn't really big enough to hold the material. Um, we had to leave a lot of ideas sort of out there in a bag waiting for when we got here because we didn't know exactly. We had an idea, we had a model, we knew sort of where we were going to be. But it was once it was up that we could really begin to manipulate it. So we spent a lot of time here really continuing to cut the piece and add more color to it and pull it and twist it and turn it and heat it um, in order for it to be in the uh, position or in the shape that it's in right now. And, and that part was really fantastic to work on site because it allowed that tailoring, which is which really goes to kind of this soft, this, this personal hand on the material that uh, you don't give it to anybody. You, you, you put it up and take care of it and, and sort of mold it yourself into the space. And I think that was um, something that we've, we've always had to tackle from the very first project we had, which we're three-fourths of the way through hanging it. It about came down on top of us. And, and it was a heavy and sharp and... <laughs> And uh, so we've been we've we've been seasoned um, in our work to uh, expect the unexpected. So can you give some specific examples of um, maybe what you had in mind and how things turned out and how they maybe lined up or did not? I mean, I think when we were first talking about it, the, um, we were talking a lot about lines and I think or like a linear piece that would be describing timelines or points on a line or we talked about knots and how they have been used to represent moments in time and so um, so then it just started shifting away from that and I think it was kind of thinking about how malleable the, the sheet material could be and the fact that it's you know I mean this piece can fold up really small and then expand um, so it's, it's like the skin and, and soft form that could really encompass the gallery. Um, but I don't know if, I don't know if that, that's kind of like the main idea. I just remember a lot of like thinking about string or thread yeah. or line. At, at one point we had, we were going to get 20 miles of, of cord uh, in here and, and 20 knots on 20 clumps <laughs> of we 20 really miles 20 of ride. We were, we have some notes that really got math nuts. What is it? The, uh, the weapons of math. <laughs> I think it's what, what we coined it from a book. And so we, we fortunately went away from that because line really didn't give us surface. And, and what we really wanted was, was surface because that was the, the plane or the ability to kind of be inside and outside. And, and so, um, you know, but that's sort of how. That's how, we, that's how we do work. We kind of start with something just to get us both excited. Oh, and, and you had mentioned text messages. 
Andrea and I, both of our schedules and lives have a hard time connecting as much as we'd like to. And so on a Friday evening, a text will start. And by one o'clock in the morning, we're still throwing ideas back and forth to each other. And we have strings of texts that are our inspiration that we just are throwing images at each other. What if, how about, oh, that's great. You know, all kinds of emojis. And it gets, <laughs> so, it gets stupid silly, but it's really been our way of, of being able to communicate when the inspiration is there and us to be able to share that and feed off of each other. And, and we do that a lot. And it's, and I, I love it. It's, it, you know, keeps you, it keeps you thinking about something different. Oh, I saw this, what about this? And those are really interesting moments in our collaboration that maybe we don't tell, but I you know, just did. Well, but I think you bring up a good point, um, just that it's not necessarily like this super serious endeavor. I mean, we have serious intentions and we want to present the work the best we can, but that there's, in, in a lot of work here, there's a sense of play and a, a sense of, well, what if we did this? What if we did that? That it's, it's just really kind of experimentation and using your imagination and, and being playful with it. And, not, and that's where you allow the ideas to come in and admitting, you know, like, oh, I don't know how to do this, or, you know, just the process of, of collaboration and bringing our different strengths and weaknesses and kind of admitting, you know, I don't know if I like this, or I don't know how this is going to work, or I'm scared of what would what, what do this, or, you know, and I was really kind of, it is scary to put up an installation when you haven't done it before, when we've made, we have all the ingredients, we've made the thing, but to then go and do it and hoping that it's, it's all going to just go, there's <laughs> a whole other thing, so, but that there's some excitement in that as well, to have to kind of problem solve on the spot and work together in that way too, so. So Colleen collaborated with um, Andrea and Jeff as well. Um, she came along though after everything was in place. Um, and I'm just uh, wondering what your process was like. I know that you came here and um, you, know, you met with Andrea. You had a good idea of what the installation was like. Uh, you experienced it. I think that was it, right? And then you came back today and we saw a performance. Um, so what was your process for preparing for today? Um, well, I had a wonderful conversation with Andrea and Jeff um, almost about two weeks ago, two weeks ago. And, you know, when you say yes to projects like this, there's something that's ahead of you that knows what needs to transpire. And in the minute I started talking to them, there was all this sort of alignment and serendipity in what they were sharing in terms of their ideas and what I've been sort of thinking about and working on and uh, researching in my own artistic life. So there was this really easy lineup, and it didn't feel, um, it felt like I had been a part of the process without actually being a part of the process, which is part of that sort of, you could call it, Young calls it the collective unconscious, or, you know, that we're, we're kind of in this um, sea, this web together. So uh, the idea of time, the idea of line, and versus sort of more kind of organic, voluptuous form is something that I'm really interested in. Having been a, been a dancer, and and um, choreographer and continuing now to make work, but then also I'm a yoga teacher and so I, I practice a lot um, on alignment. That's what yoga is all about. And it's a very geometric form. It's all about lining up your legs in the right way, lining up your arms in the right way. So physically I was really interested in those parallels um, and the juxtaposition of that in the space. Um, and then, so after talking with them, I went back to the drawing board, which is like going to the studio and just moving and seeing what and I spent time um, kind of around these questions of what does it mean to be soft in the body? What does it mean to be soft in space? What does it mean um, to then form a line? Or what does it mean to be sort of what I think of as more sort of the ballet, Cunningham, certain dance techniques that are very much about geometry, very much about line. Um, and in my piece, you could probably see some of that it's sort of lining up versus like, <laughs> Amplify. <laughs> when I work in the studio, I work uh, physically, but I also have what I call a choreo book, a choreo journal. So I have a book and I sketch, I notate all of the things that I come up with. And I make little drawings of little, Chet was looking at them in the back. Yeah. <laughs> little drawings of the little um, movements that I do. 
and um, kind of sequence ideas, and then I gather images a lot. So visual art is really important to me in my working process. I'm always um, looking at things, and I, I gather a collection of visuals for my next project um, to inform what I'm going to choreograph. So there, there, there were some images that were coming forth. And then I got inspired by some music, which you didn't hear here, but it was sort of playing in my mind. Um, and, you know, this idea of the metronome sort of keeping the beat, but almost um, sort of <laughs> in a controlled fashion. So having that musical note in my mind that was sort of my own thing to subvert what this, what this was doing. Um, and then uh, some of it was improvisation. So what you saw was the first time it had ever been done and the last. So I'll never do that again. It'll never be like that again. <laughs> so that's what I was wondering also. So there were parts that were determined in advance, choreographed, and then there was a part of it that was impromptu. Yeah. How was that ratio? How much was prepared? I would say a good, um, I'd say a third prepared two-thirds improvised. I'd say a th a, another third of um, that two-thirds sort of choreographed in the sense that I had particular uh, physical themes that I was improvising off of. So I had this idea of the hands and sewing and what it means, like the gesture of hands, the gesture um, of, you know, like I kept pointing or I had a whole sequence where I was playing with gesture um, because that, that was really coming through for me in this, just all the little seams and the delicacy. I also knit and one of the last pieces I did was with yarn and line and I had all this yarn and so I brought that in. Um, another theme was um, moving between sort of the more uh, geometric, like balletic form and then this sort of like crumpled, um, decayed, you know, sort of like animal form that um, I was sort of playing with. So little, um, then the, you know, there were little sort of, you could call them motifs maybe, that I was improvising off of. So kind of three different processes in one. So basically, um, I think there are two things going on in this exhibition. Um, all the artists, well, there are these um, okay, formal structures, um, these systems of organization, that the artists are engaging and working within. And then at the same time, there are these, um, as you mentioned, these uh, themes of play, um, risk-taking, failure, um, the human hand, and imperfection. And in your curator's statement, um, you describe those as kind of left brain and right brain. So you know, one half is more analytical and structured, um, and the other half is um, loose and less predictable. Um, and those two things are resolved in varying degrees in works in this exhibition. Uh, you know, when you first come in on the right-hand side, there are these like really wonderful, um, very colorful geometric paintings by Gianna Comito. And I remember when we first got those, um, I opened up the packaging, and I thought that maybe some um, paint had come off in transit, um, because there's these sections where the paint looks like it has flaked off. Um, and actually, that's not the case. Um, when we looked at the original photos, that was part of the artist's process, um, this, these imperfections that happen. And then there's Andrea's and Mesh, which is right there by the camera, and that has all these strings hanging down, um, and for some reason, that doesn't seem as disruptive. Um, so, you know, in general, I think we're always looking for order. We need some, we do need some kind of structure, uh, but at the same time, we need the exact opposite. And I think that's part of the reason this installation has been um, so successful. When people come in and they experience it for the first time, uh, I think their initial response is like, like play. Um, and they're kind of really kind of grounded in the moment. And, you know, nowadays, we're for the most part, not really like that. Um, we're always multitasking. Um, maybe we're thinking about someplace else would rather be or something we have to do in the future or we're on social media. There's just a lot of distractions. Um, two things I think that really anchor us um, are play and risk taking. And with these three different kinds of artists here, we have a designer, um, we have a performer, and we have a plastic artist. Um, I was wondering um, for each of you how much um, risk taking and play factor in the work you do. Taking in play? Yeah. Um, well, I think I mean, in terms of play, I have an almost eight-year-old daughter, so I think having 
a child in your life just brings that sense of play completely right back and also presentness um, when I'm with her she's not preoccupied with what does she have to do or you know an email I have to send or and I try to really force myself or sometimes it's not I don't have to force myself to be really present with her and mirror that kind of just in the moment thing that children can have but um, then that kind of, you know, that seeps into my studio practice, and I think play and risk-taking are really closely intertwined in that way of, um, at least in my own work, I don't, you know, I have ongoing series and, and processes that I, I like to use, that I've been using over time, but I, I mean, I feel like the work in this show is, is newer directions, and I want to have that space for play and risk-taking in my work and try new things, and not be afraid that, whoa, if, I'm, if I do something that's a little bit different, are people gonna like it? Or it's just, I have, I think as artists, we have to make the work that, that we just feel compelled and we can't help ourselves to make. That is just, we have these, kind of have these images in our mind's eye that are, I think, once described as like these nagging images in our, in our mind's eye that we just have to kind of get out and make. Um, so I, I see risk taking in play as just essential to being an artist, but also it's just really human, again, going back to that. Um, and yeah, we, I think people get kind of removed from that and are, just have a lot of fear and anxiety that kind of keep you from doing those things, but keeps you alive, so <laughs> it keeps you living, but. Um, one of my teachers, Susan Redhorst, um, talks a lot about play and how play actually demands a lot of rigor to be able to play as an adult. Um, that in our culture we have misled ourselves to believe that play is all a sort of frivolity and gaiety. Um, that as an artist, as you mature, as your sort of, um, you know, tunneling in deepens, to be able to play requires um, dedication, it requires making that time, making that space, it requires having enough connection to sort of your imagination to be able to then access it in a playful way and to be able to recognize what is play versus just sort of slacking off or repetition of something that you've already done or reverting back to a pattern that um, somebody else gave to you so it's just a reiteration of someone else's thing. Um, so I look at play as really crucial to work and I think the most sort of brilliant moments, magical moments when I'm making work, but also like when I'm working on the magazine, um, we just had a, like a photo shoot for um, our winter recipes and we were getting really, really like tunneled in on it. We were like, okay, it has to be this, it has to be this, it has to be this. And then at one point I was like, okay, take that out, move this. Okay, Maria, you just do what you want to do. And everyone was like, ah. Oh. They could breathe, and then they could play a little bit, and then the photo came through. But before that, we were trying to push it, and it wasn't going to happen. It just wasn't going to happen. So you, I feel like play is behind every great work. <laughs> Who didn't look at this behind us? <laughs> and, uh, and not think three-dimensional twister, right? <laughs> Come on, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, I'm, I'm, I've, been, I've been accused up until probably the day before yesterday of being child and not growing up and probably will be. Um, so playing is, is, is essential to me breathing. So that part is never a, a real big deal for me. It probably gets me in more trouble than it does otherwise, but I, I just feel that as a creative problem solver, if you're not playing, then you're not seeing the problems. Not that they playfulness or this illusion that playfulness is silly. Um, it's actually where the edges of things are, and it's how you find new paths into, uh, into endpoints because you're, play, you're in the edges, you're on the edges, you're just on the other side of the fence trying to get back over again, but you jumped over there on purpose. It's those kinds of paths to an end that actually provide insight. Um, and so I find it extremely valuable. Um, I did a TEDx talk a year ago and, and the component of failure was actually the theme of that talk. And, and my first sort of line out of that was the famous philosopher, um, uh, Michael Tyson, 
who who said that um, everyone has a plan until they get hit in the face. Um, and 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 I run my studios. I teach my classes by um, hitting um, with problems and hitting with changes and hitting with with issues um, to my students and the way I operate so that failure comes immediately um, because it's the only way, well, <clears throat> it's, it's the only way that sort of gets you off of the tunnel effect and gets you away from it is to sort of have to kind of exhale and, and take the hit um, and, and I, just, I just think it's really important to creative problem solving and, and not just for creatives everybody I, I think everybody on the planet is a creative problem solver it's how we get through our day depending on what our admiration is but um, I, I think we can all learn from being a lot more comfortable and, and purposefully failing so these are some serious observations about play and other things and that's why we're so grateful for artists because we need them um, and thank you everyone for attending <laughs>